never felt so young and strong this place just feels like home oh and i'm just inside the game just inside the gate where loved ones wait god's light shining from the throne fills heaven with the song good to see you on this wednesday night and boy what a blessing it is to to have you here in the house of the lord it just seems like we've got a lot of folks who've been out sick today and uh we for the first time we, we had to cancel Master Club's night because a lot of the leadership was sick, and so uh, uh, that's a definitely a, a major prayer request. I pray that everybody get get back on their feet and quit coughing and all the other kind of things that they're going through. But it's so glad to see you here tonight, and I, I pray that you came looking for something from God's Word tonight. I pray that you came with a heart set on set exalting who He is, and so we're going to open the word, uh, open the service tonight in a word of prayer. And Brother Larry, I'm going to ask you if you would just stand and open us in a word of prayer tonight. Amen, amen. If you would take your hymnals this evening, and if you're able to, uh, go to page 503. The song is, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. Amen. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I have sought since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Let's do this for just a moment. Uh, we used to do a lot of testimonies, and uh, I like testimonies to be kind of spontaneous, but listen, we just sang a song, Since Jesus Came Into My Heart. Somebody very quickly, just tell me something different about your life that uh, happened since Jesus came into your heart. Somebody help me out tonight. Go ahead, Brother Al. Amen, amen. Stop drinking, stop smoking. Amen. Did I see another hand over here? Amen. My appetite changed for the things you want to consume. Amen. Praise God. Well, we're going to sing that second verse. We're going to ask somebody else after the second verse. Let's sing. I have ceased from my wanderings and going astray since Jesus came into my heart. And my sins, which were many, are all washed away since Jesus came into my heart. Sin. Jesus came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus 
Jesus came into my heart. Somebody else give me a little short testimony. What's changed since you got saved? Go ahead, Brother Ron. Amen. Made a life brand new. Amen. Well, that's good stuff. I like it. Anybody else? Just quick. To, yes, Miss Dolan. Brought me hope and encouragement. I like that. Let's sing that last verse now. I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart. And I'm happy, so happy as onward I go since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart. Since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Amen. Well, you're singing so good. Let's turn over to page 708. 708, the little chorus. Behold what manner of love the Father. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. Behold what manner of love the Father has given unto us. That we should be called the sons of God. That we should be called the sons of God. Oh, that's good. And some of y'all about to close your book. I knew you were going to do that. But tonight we're going to go over to 713. 713. Seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Amen. You can be seated tonight. I appreciate the songs. It sure helps me as a pastor. Get my heart ready for the preaching of the word and to be receptive to it as well. We'll be finding our place in Acts chapter 3 tonight. Acts chapter 3 as you're going there. Uh, our missionary of the week this week is Brother Brent Carr, evangelist. And I had the newsletter sitting on my desk and I walked out and left it sitting in there. But uh, I encourage you to continue to pray for the Carr family. We sure love them and they're a blessing to this church. And I uh, want to say I've uh, got a few things taking place. Obviously this coming Sunday is Easter. And we want you to come, and not only to come, but bring family, bring friends, bring people, bring people who are out of church, people that need uh, Jesus. And uh, we're going to have a great time. We're going to have things for the children that day. Uh, but that evening, we're going to have a special service. We'll just have regular service, and then we'll have the Lord's Supper to follow 
I encourage you to be here for that as well. Brother Lance got called into work just uh, shortly before the service tonight. Be in prayer for him. Many, like I said, many people already sick. Be praying for Miss Beal's family. Uh, just uh, be meeting with them tomorrow, and um, the 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 funeral will be the visitation is eleven o'clock, and the funeral is at twelve o'clock on this coming Monday, uh, Monday after Easter. And so be praying for that. And if you're able to come, I'd encourage you to come just to be an encouragement to the family. And, of course, that evening will also be men's fellowship, and we want you here for that. Then, of course, then uh, uh, edge to go on April the 13th for our teenagers that are here, and we sure want everybody to go to that. All right. We found our place in uh, the book of Acts, chapter 3. I mentioned some time ago, I've probably mentioned it several times, we, we regularly get things in the mail around here that try to help us. Uh, at least it's, it's you know, a, a product that they say will help you build your church. And it's a business plan. It's not a biblical plan, but it's a business plan on how to, how to get, uh, grow your attendance. And you'll probably find a few ideas in there that may be helpful to you, but the, really the truth of the matter is this, to get people to come to church, to people to hear the gospel, uh, really we just need the Bible plan. We just need to follow what the Word of God says, and God will send the increase. The truth is we need to follow the Bible plan. The, uh, we don't need to find a new plan. We don't need to find a new gimmick. Um, I, I, I grew up in churches that ran different promotional services every single week. Uh, there, there's some churches around here that they, they've had everything from monster trucks to chicken dinners. And I'm not saying that's wrong. It's just not where God has led me. I really don't have a problem having fellowships, don't have a problem having activities, don't have a problem doing things. But that's not how you build the church. You build the church by presenting the gospel to other people and, and, and being a witness to them. In our text, several things and people are going to need to be identified and, and maybe even looked at a little deeper than just uh, recognizing their name. Um, but we also need to say that we're going to be looking at chapter 3 tonight, but there's a space of time that takes place between chapter 2 and chapter 3. We're not exactly sure how long of a time that is, but chapter 2 was power-packed. Chapter 2 of Acts was an awesome chapter. It was, it was uh, there where they, uh, they, there was the giving of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit literally came down and, and, and dwelt upon on people and during that time. It was the day of Pentecost and a great sermon preached by Peter. And so uh, there was a great amount of things that took place in that chapter. And I love the second chapter of the book of Acts. As we come into chapter 3, there's some things that take place. And there's three main characters that we're going to look at tonight. Uh, first off, there's a lame man, and then there's Peter, and there's John. And so tonight, as we look at this, I want us to see, uh, uh, as we look at the passage of Scripture in just a moment, the lame man here is a, is a guy that has a lot of issues. The Bible is going to tell you that he's been lame from his birth, that every day somebody picks him up and he carries him to the gate of, of, the, of the temple and sits him down at the beautiful gate, it's the gate beautiful, if you will. But it's a great picture of the issues and the problems of the modern-day church. And tonight, that's what I want to preach about, is, is making this church a success. And uh, by looking at this story and seeing what it has to say, this, this man, uh, he was at the temple, but not in the temple. Can I tell you, that's a big problem in, in our churches today. It can be a big problem even at Waste of Baptist Church. You can be here, but not really in here. Okay? You're at worship, but not worshiping. Now, I understand it's Wednesday night, and you're saying, Preacher, you're getting ready to unload a heavy message on us tonight. I, I'm trying to help us as a church to see that I, I'm thankful that everybody comes and everybody's here, but I want us to get in. Not just attend, but get in on what's taking place. A lot of times people come, and they're not interested in what's being preached or taught. They're just happy to be present. Can I tell you, it's important that we come with our cups lifted up, saying, Lord, fill my cup, Lord, let it overflow, Lord, whatever the case may be, uh, but we really just need to come expecting something from God's Word. A lot of times we're sitting through but not shouting it out. In other words, our hearts fail to be stirred. There ought to be something when we get into God's Word and we study God's Word, that there ought to be something. If you know the Lord is your Savior and you're right with Him and you're doing what you're supposed to do and, and really trying to be obedient to Him, your heart ought to get stirred up. And listen, at times when your heart gets stirred, you'll, you'll begin to have a little output of that. You'll, you'll shout, you'll say amen every once in a while, or at least give a holy grunt, amen? But tonight I want us to see that a lot of times we come, but we're not in. We give, but we're not really invested in. 
We give our offering, we even give our tithes, we give to missions. And you say, but preacher, isn't that investing in the ministry? Technically, yes, but the truth of the matter is this. A lot of times we'll do something like that or we'll attend, but we don't want to get involved in the work. Can I tell you, every one of us has been called to get involved in the work of the Lord, and we do so through the local church. So how do you know which one you are? How do you know if you're really uh, in church or just at church? Well, do you leave the same way you came? Do you leave stronger than you came? Do you leave in a more Christ-like example than the way you got here? Do you only get excited? Or do you act upon that excitement? And so those are some things we can glance at, we can look at and say, listen, Lord, am I really just at church or Lord, am I really in the church? You see, one of the things I noticed about this man, he'd been doing this for years, that somebody had been bringing him to this place. He was a man that could not take care of himself. He had great needs in his life. He couldn't go out and work a job. He couldn't dig a ditch. He couldn't uh, uh, do any of the things that people could do. But the great tragedy of this lame man was not where he was, but how he was. The great problem in this man's life was what was really taking place inside his life. All the previous handouts had not bettered this man. They had just got him along. He was not in need of a handout. He was in need of a hand up. I think we need to start looking at our own lives and deciding, am I getting what I need? And the truth of the matter is this, what he needed was readily available. And so many people had passed him by. The other two characters of this passage of Scripture are Peter and John, great disciples of the Lord. But they're definitely two different types of people. Uh, These two, as we've mentioned, uh, I don't know if you remember it, uh, but they were in constant competition against each other. You have to really study your Bible to see that, but even at at the tomb of Jesus, they both ran to the tomb. One of them outran the other, but the other one went on inside. They were difference in character, if you will. Peter was one that was much more outspoken. He was aggressive. Peter's the one that that always inserted his foot in his mouth. Okay? John was just kind of the opposite of that. He was more of the, not timid isn't the right word, but he was more of a quiet guy. He sought peaceful solutions to things. He liked to work in the background versus the foreground. Peter goes on to become a great leader of all the disciples there, or the apostles there. He's the one that really, uh, based upon his character, and when God refined his character, he became a great use to the uh, uh, work of God. And I, I bring them both up for this reason. They picture for us that every church or every ministry will have people of different personalities. But the focus, when it's right, a lot can be accomplished. We're going to need somebody to take the lead, but we also need somebody to quietly work in the background. We need people of every personality. You say, but man, that person's abrasive. Peter was abrasive. (laughs) Matter of fact, he was pretty bold. Man, think about some of the preaching that Peter did. He called people on the carpet. I'm talking about uh, uh, this, this new philosophy that's kind of going through uh, churches, and I'm, I would say Christendom, but I'm, I'm not sure that it, Christianity is really involved in some of it, but people where they're afraid to offend. We live in a society today, a, a generation, a younger generation. Uh, the, the, I'm looking at a lot of people in here that are my age or older, and, and you, you weren't afraid. Listen, my daddy was not afraid to offend, okay? My daddy kind of you know, had, a, had a degree in that, a master's degree or a doctorate degree in offending. <laughs> but we live in a society where people are afraid to offend. Can I tell you, the word of God is going to be offensive because it's going to call us out on our sin. And we can't shelter away from those things. So in looking at this passage tonight, I want to look at it and, and, and study it from a kind of a different angle than what we have in the past, but how to make this church a success. So let's begin reading in verse 1. Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. And a certain man, lame from his mother's womb, was carried, whom they, had, or whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. Who, seeing Peter and John uh, about to go into the temple, asked an alms. And Peter, fastening his eyes upon him with John, said, Look on us. 
And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give, uh, give I thee. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand, and he lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered with them into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and they knew that it was he which had sat uh, 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 for alms uh, at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which had happened unto him. And as the lame man which was healed held Peter and John, all the people ran together unto them into the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. And when Peter saw it, he answered unto the people, Ye men of Israel, why marvel ye at this? Or why look ye so earnestly on us as though by our own power or holiness we had made this man to walk? The God of Abraham and of Isaac and of Jacob, the God of our fathers, hath glorified his son Jesus, whom ye delivered up and denied him in the presence of Pilate when he was uh, uh, determined to let him go. But ye denied the Holy One and the just and desired a murder to be granted unto you and killed the Prince of Life, whom God hath raised from the dead, whereof we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, hath made this man strong, whom ye see and know. Yea, the faith which is by him hath given him this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Let's pray. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray that you would bless your word tonight in our lives. Lord God, may we glean from it tonight. May we uh, gather something from it, Lord God, tonight that may uh, influence, may it refine, may it change, may it make better, Lord God, our lives. Lord, I want to thank you for your precious word. I want to thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to preach it. But Lord God, I thank you for the opportunity to be changed by it as well. Lord, I pray, God, that you would loose my lips, Lord God, help me to be able to speak uh, with clarity and with understanding tonight. And Lord God, I pray you direct our paths, Lord God, through this message, and we just ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. As we go back and we begin to consider what is taking place, we had mentioned that in chapter 2, uh, many things had happened. They had, the, the, the disciples had been there and they, they had witnessed, uh, uh, you know, from a distance, many of them had uh, witnessed Jesus being crucified. We know that he's risen again. The day of Pentecost has come and, and the Holy Spirit's been poured out upon them. As I look at this passage of Scripture that we're looking at today, I see Peter and John being faithful to the house of God. I want to say tonight that success requires preparation. Success requires preparation. It says, Now Peter and John went up together into the temple at the hour of prayer, being the ninth hour. Uh, it was a regular practice of theirs to, to be in the house of God for a time of prayer. But I want us to understand this. When I think of preparation, there must be a conversation, a talking with God. We need to talk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Peter and John are headed to a prayer service, but prayer meeting was not just a service to attend, but it had been a habit for them. And we saw that all the way back in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. And Acts chapter 1, verse 14 says, These all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brethren. You'll remember this. They'd gone into that upper room. They'd gone into that place initially for fear of what was taking place. But God, when He came and rested upon them and gave them the Holy Spirit, they had already been spending day after day, and night after night, in prayer and in fasting, the Bible says in prayer and in supplication, really seeking God's direction. And I, I tell you that for this reason, they had continued on through that. Even after the uh, Holy Ghost landed upon them, we see that they are continuing to do the same things they had done, maybe not hiding in a room, but now going to the house of God for a time of prayer. There was going to be all kinds of people at the house of prayer. There was going to be all kinds of people there at the temple for all kinds of reasons. Again, just like in our services, some were going uh, out, of, out of habit. Some were going out of feeling responsible to go. But then there's a difference when you are going to the place for a specific purpose of getting there just to hear and to talk with God and to hear Him reply to you. And so in these earlier prayer services, the Lord had showed up and He had poured out the Holy Spirit upon them. Now, that same Holy Spirit that was poured out upon them, that had given them boldness, that had given them power, that guess what? That same Holy Spirit now indwells you and I. 
which means we are still able to have that same power. We are still able to have that same boldness of the faith. Now, I would ask you tonight, in preparation for services, and preparation for whether it be Wednesday night and, and all the things that take place on a Wednesday, and I know today's probably been a hectic day because it was another day. <laughs> it's just another day, and the fact of the matter is this, it's a day where we, we set a little bit of time aside in the middle of the week for prayer, and we set it aside for some Bible study, because we know that this, this world wears us down, but we ought to come with a prepared heart and a, and a heart ready not to get prepared once we get here, but to come already prayed up, to come already energized, to come already boldly and with power to the throne of God. See, it's not just talking with Jesus, it's walking with Jesus. The term walking here is used to describe being in the right place to receive instruction and direction. We see Peter and John, they're going to a place that God had ordained for them to meet at. Uh, it's an opportunity that they're going to they're go and just spend some time with God and, and, and in God's Word and in God's house around people that supposedly have the same interests as they do. And, and here's the thing, they go wanting an outcome. I would say, do we come to church expecting and wanting and desiring of God an outcome in our own lives? Uh, are we going just to, to, to punch a clock, or are we really going to receive something of the Lord and to invest something in the service? Now, as we think about this, uh, and, and uh, we have a genuine interest in the outcome, but when I look at this, I say, are all here? Are we all here? You say, preacher, we're all here. We're all sitting here right in front of you. I'm talking about, are we all here? Because a lot of times I've sat in pews of churches and I was there physically, but I was not all there. I've been at work. I've been at home. I've been at the lake. I've been in the mountains. I've been at the beach. I've been out fishing. I've been out hunting. I've been in a lot of places, although my body was sitting in church. Where's our mind at? Tonight, can I say tonight with genuine, is my mind the mind of Christ? Do I really have a heart that's set upon Him? Am I all here? Am I searching, listening, and desiring something from God? You see, if we do, we come with that expectation and that uh, 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 preparation, God will provide the path to walk. He'll give us the direction for our life, and He'll, he'll give us the power to walk. Secondly, I see that success in a church is not only going to require preparation, but it's going to require procedures. In verses 2 through 7, the story continues, and a certain lame man from his mother's womb was carried, whom they had laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful, to ask alms of them that entered into the temple. I'll continue to read here in just a moment. I remember when I was in Israel, we were walking, we were, we were outside the temple gate, we were... Um, I don't remember exactly what we were near, but I remember it was kind of like a tight quarters. We were having to go through a security checkpoint, and we came out, and there was a little lady there, and she really was poor. And she was doing exactly what this lame man is doing. She had a little cup there, and she was just begging. It was kind of funny because we all kind of looked to our, you know, you know we, we see people begging all the time. We, we have signs that we put up all over our city. Our city has put up signs all over our city saying, don't give to the people that are begging. It was kind of wild when I was there in Jerusalem, and, and I don't remember if Walt remembers this because uh, uh, we weren't always walking together, but everybody kind of stopped and looked toward our guide, wondering if it was okay to do something for her. And he said, sure. He says she probably is very destitute. She probably has great needs. And so several people gave money to this lady. And, and so I, I'm thinking about, as we look at this, this layman, it's kind of part of their culture to see those who can't really provide for themselves, that they sit out there and wait for somebody to have a little excess, a little extra, and, and, to, and, and give handouts to them. Now this man sees Peter and John, and it says in verse 3, who's seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple asking alms. And you would think somebody going to church would be ready to help somebody out, wouldn't you? And it says, and Peter fastened his eyes upon him with John and said, look on us. And he gave heed unto them, expecting to receive something of him. Of them. Then said, and then Peter said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I give thee, or such as I have, give I thee, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and his ankle bones received strength. Well, I know that we don't have supernatural 
or God does not do people with supernatural healing ability. God still heals, and God still can, but he doesn't do it the way he did it in the uh, early New Testament. But as we look at this, I want us to see something. We need to be looking. Peter and John, whether it's the man's question or whatever, recognize this man sitting there, and he has a need. If we're really honest with God tonight, not honestly with the preacher, I'm not asking you to raise hands or anything like that, a lot of times we are purposely blind to the needs of others. There are times when we kind of uh, miss the opportunities that are all around us because we purposely put blinders on. Peter and John could have been so absorbed in their conversation and so used to those who begged that they could have just passed on by. Can I tell you, it's very important that we are focused on our responsibility for the moment. I believe that their conversation, and I would encourage you, let your conversations be on the things that are getting ready to take place. How how many of us really talk about the things of God on the way to the house of God? How many of us, as soon as the service is over, switch our conversations to other things other than the things of God? I would encourage us that as we sit in the auditorium or as we are are sitting in Sunday school or we're sitting, even our safety team, they they have a purpose of why they're there. They ought to be focusing on why they're there. The greeters ought to be focused on the visitors and the people to greet them and to make them feel welcome and help them find a seat and all those kind of things. And then we as members that aren't necessarily greeters and we're not necessarily on the safety team, we're not on, on, on the teaching team, we ought to make others feel welcome. We ought to escort them to our seat if we can. Have them sit with us. Do, do whatever. But here's the thing. We need to be looking for the opportunities to invest in others. Peter and John could have been talking about very spiritual things on the way there. I, I can tell you this. There, there's been times where even when talking about spiritual matters, we sometimes miss opportunities because we're focused on the conversation versus the action that the conversation should have brought us to. We see not only the, the, the looking, but the lending. In verses 4 through 6, <clears throat> we, we see that Peter uh, uh, does what he can. He didn't have uh, uh, money, but he had ability. And I would say this, not only do we need to be looking, but we need to be lending. Lending of time and of talent. Because if we're not careful, our business will cause us to miss opportunity. God has abundantly equipped the believer. You said, preacher, but I can't teach. But you've been equipped to do something for the glory of God. God equips those he desires to use. And if you don't feel like you have the ability or the uh, uh, talent at this moment, God will train you into that if you'll just be willing and submissive to what God would have you to do. And when I look at this passage of Scripture, because it's not just that he looked and he lent what he had, but the labor. In verse 7, it uses this phrase that he took him by the right hand and he lifted him up. Relying on Christ for the task at hand is vital. Or excuse me, giving the, hand up, uh, giving the man a hand up uh, at that time, it's vital to see souls of the sinner and not the sins of the sinner. Can you go back to that statement with me again? Part of the labor of, of the church is giving the gospel, presenting Christ, it's not a necessarily you got to have a certain format or, or, or you know, be able to recite the track that you're handing out or any of those kind of things. It's really just about telling about Jesus and what he's done for you. That's really all witnessing is. Giving your testimony about Christ and who Christ is. But it's vital that when we are talking to people that we see their souls and not their sin. And I say that for this reason. Some of the greatest churches I know have had some of the vilest sinners to attend them that have been saved and transformed. I'll, I'll never forget, uh, down in Atlanta, Georgia, there's, there's a church that's been growing for quite some time. They have a wonderful, wonderful pastor. And I remember one time we were uh, uh, hearing him preach, and he, he was saying uh, about some of the people that have been saved through the ministry there in Atlanta. He says, we have people who sing in our choir that were once prostitutes on the street. He said, they're not that anymore. They've been changed. God is glorious to save them. They, they put, gave them families and all these kind of things. He said, we've got drunkards that, that, that serve. We've got people who've been to jail. We've got people who've been to prison that are now serving in our church, and they're, they're singing in our choirs, and they're doing all this. And, and what's the difference is somebody, somebody at one time or other, looked beyond their sin and saw a soul that needed to hear about Christ. 
We've got to quit prejudging people about who will and who won't receive Christ. It's about just presenting Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ transformed the thief on the cross. He forgave Moses who had committed murder. He forgave David who was not only an adulterer and a murderer. And then used them for his glory. And so here's the thing. We may have to look beyond the tattoos, the earrings, and, and all the different external things and allow God to change the inside and then he'll change some of the outside. But the fact of the matter is this, we've got to get beyond what we see and see beyond the exterior of the person. The looking, the lending, the labor, and then the leaning. In verse 6, we see it. He says, in the name of Jesus Christ, and Nazareth, rise up and walk. He said, I don't have anything that's going to help you other than Jesus. He said, really, he said, uh, silver and gold have I none, but he, here's what he could have said just as easily. He says, the money I have won't help you. The money I have will only sustain you in this living life and may get you to the next meal, but it, here's the fact of the matter. What you really need is Jesus. And can I tell you tonight, if you know the Lord is your Savior, you have what every soul needs. So rely on Christ for the task at hand. Don't try to do things in your own strength. Know where spiritual power originates. Spiritual power, let me, let me help you tonight, cannot be personally manufactured. A lot of people try to fake it. And I'm not, not here to preach tonight about beating up other people, about trying to fake things. Uh, it's usually pretty evident when people do that. But it comes from God. And it comes from having talked with Him and walked with Him. And more than that, trusting Him. And God, if we will just lean on Him and rely on Him, that's the reason why Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct thy paths. That, that's the idea of when you're walking in the street and you see somebody that needs Jesus, and you, you, you kind of have a little nudge in your heart, uh, but I'm sure, not really sure what to say and not really sure how that person's going to respond. Can I tell you, none of that stuff matters. Present Jesus. Share Jesus. Allow Him to give you the strength Success requires preparation, it requires procedures, but it requires purpose as well. What is the purpose of this or any ministry supposed to be? It's Christ. It's, the, it, it's, it's, it's everything. We, we, we go back to verse 6 and we see in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. Christ is the glory for whatever ministry outreach we have. And I thank God that, that I believe that's taking place. And I believe it ought to take place in, in, in as, as bold of a manner as you possibly can to make sure that in everything, Christ gets the glory. No ministry is the purpose of building a, um, one's own reputation. It's not about you know, bragging about, man, we got this preacher, boy, he, he, he's... Because we don't have that. The fact of the matter is this, what we all have is sinners saved by grace trying to glorify a holy God. That's worthy of our worship, worthy of our praise. The purpose is, uh, our purpose is filled, uh, fulfilled when we, require, uh, when, we, when, when we will require our own obedience. When we are willing to be obedient, the purpose will take place. Purpose of successful ministries must have the souls of the lost as its priority. I believe that we are to disciple. I believe we are to mentor. I believe we are to do all those things. But here's the thing. The church's responsibility is to go. It's not to sit. It's not even to sit here. Listen, our, pur our, our purpose is to go and to send to outside the walls of this church to get the gospel out all around this world. We've been studying the book of Revelation. It, uh, it needs to become a, such a priority in us when we see the things that must soon come to pass, the Word of God tells us. God blesses those whose preparations are right and the procedures are right and their purpose is right. And when that takes place, we'll see progress. Success requires progress. In verses 8 through 16, how do you, how do you judge progress? Changed lives. In verse 8, we see a change. The Bible says, And he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered into the temple, walking and leaping and praising God. Can I tell you that's something he had never done before? That was out of character for him. The difference is he has a new character. He's a new creature in Christ. And so uh, uh, we, we, we need to get beyond what we used to be 
You say, but preacher, I, I'm just, I've always been timid. Can I tell you this? I'd be praying that God would give me a shout, that God would give me a voice, that God would give me some, something beyond what I used to be and, and, and help me to have this new walk with him, this change. You see, he's no longer a lame man. He's no longer a beggar. He's no longer at the temple, but he's now in the temple, both physically and spiritually. He's no longer pestering people at the door. He's praising God within. Boy, we, we got so much to praise Him for. We've got so much to give glory to Him for. And, and, and nobody had to prompt Him. Let me just, that's, I, I, I want us to understand this. Nobody had to prompt Him to ask for alms. No, and so here's the thing. Nobody uh, prompt you to have to praise God. It ought to be part of who you are. That we just give glory to God and we do so in a way that somebody may ask, what, is the, what do you mean, praise God for that? Or what do you mean? And, and, and just sometimes just the way that you present, and, and then people are going to watch your life, so they're going to hear your voice, and they're going to hear what you have to say, and it, provon- it prompts questions about the glory of, of, of the, the satisfaction and the peace that you have within. Not only it change lives, but we see in this passage of Scripture lives that are challenged. His testimony reached people. In verse 9 it says, And all the people saw him walking and praising God. And they knew it was he which sat for alms at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at that which would happen unto him. Can I tell you, if you really have been saved and gloriously saved and your life's been changed, and, and, and listen, you don't have to have been as vile of a person as maybe somebody else, but the fact of the matter is this, there will be such a change that people will notice a difference about you, especially if you're the one that's jumping, leaping, praising God. The thing is, is if the Holy Spirit is so full in you, sometimes we, the North Carolina word we use for it is get the I can't help it. And I don't want to help it. I just want it to, to, to have, a, have an, uh, uh, a direction it can go in and so people began to praise God. The testimony was reaching people. You see, I'll preach, he had just got healed. He had just got in. He had just, he just got saved. Can I tell you, that's the problem. We think it's only for the new guy. What about us people been saved for a length of time? I've been saved for almost 50 years. About 47 years right now, 46 years I've been saved. Listen, I don't want to lose my shout. I don't want to lose my praise. I don't want to lose my testimony. I do know this. Uh, when I came here 15, 16 years ago, however long it's been now, uh, but when I came here, I remember people for that I used to go to school with coming here, and they were looking to see what's different. And then they say, uh, we, many of us are still aren't really good friends anymore because there's a difference in me. Can I tell you, those that are like you want to stick around. Those who ain't like you are going to want to separate or become like you, one or the other. Either way, these folks had gathered around. He had a testimony. It was a visible change. And when a visible change in your life creates a viable interest, again, that viable interest, people wonder, what's different about him? I know that guy. That guy's the guy that used to sit out there, uh, out there begging alms at the front gate. And here's what they'll say about you. That's the guy I used to see down at the bar. That's the guy I used to see doing this. That's the guy I used to see doing that. The viable interest is this. Something good is different about that guy. He's not the same guy he used to be. His clinging creates other questions. Look at verse 11, and I love this. That's probably one of the first times I ever saw it. And this is the lame man which was healed, held Peter and John. All the Peter ran together unto them at the porch that is called Solomon's, greatly wondering. Uh, as I looked at it and as I tried to study it out, the Bible says he held Peter and John. He was hugging their necks. He was, so, he was so glad they didn't just give him a, a little coin to drop in his cup. They'd found, he'd found somebody that really cared more about him and his condition than he'd ever met in his life. I love it when, when people begin to hug necks because all of a sudden they realize somebody cared more about them than what they could give them. It wasn't about Peter and John. It wasn't about... This guy could benefit the church, or this guy. No, it was a soul that needed to be saved, and that's all that mattered to them. Would you like to see your doctor get saved? I sure would. But I'd also like to see my trash man get saved. I'd like to see those Hispanic guys running that fiber optic cable for the last 
however long, tearing up my yard. I'd love to see them get saved. Because they're a soul in need of a Savior. We see connected lives. This lame man was definitely connected to Peter and John. He was probably hugging them around their neck or, or you know, whatever the case may be. But it goes on in this passage. And when all these things begin to take place and all these people have gathered around, they're, they're in amazement of what has taken place with this lame man. Peter, being the good Baptist preacher that he is, begins to preach. He begins to share with them Jesus Christ. And if you would do, read through your Bible, begin in verse 12 and following, and Peter saw it and he answered unto the people, and here he begins to preach. But he preaches through the whole rest of this chapter. And he comes to chapter 4, and this is what happened. It says, And as he spake unto the people, the priests and the captains of the temple and the Sadducees came upon him, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus Christ the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. How be it? Many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Can I tell you? They connected. The word penetrated hearts. These people were gathered around and they've witnessed this great thing. And so as Peter turns it into a message, what was his message? Jesus. It was just Jesus. The man you crucified. The one that, the one that, that before that, you know, just a couple days before that, you were shout, shouting um, uh, Hosanna. Next thing you know, you're denying him, allowing him to be nailed to a cross. That same Jesus, whom is God the Father, raised from the dead, that's the one we're worshiping because he's alive and well. The gospel message created demands for a response. Now, that response came in different fashions, and yours will as well. When you present Christ, there will be different responses. The, it grieved the priests and the temple officers and the Sadducees. They couldn't stand it. They, 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 you know why? Because they had religion, but they did not have Christ. They had done everything they could do to wipe the name of Christ off the face of the earth. They had shouted with great voices, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And they did. <laughs> and that didn't even work. Not for eternity. He came back up three days later, alive and well. They were grieved by it. So much so that it cost Peter and John and preaching the gospel may cost you something. Sharing the gospel may cost you something. Peter and John are thrown in prison overnight. The Bible says that they laid hands on them and put them in the hold until the next day, for it was now eventide. They're going to deal with them later. And I would say this, there may be a great cost to sharing the gospel. You'll lose some friends. You'll have some family that will turn their backs on you. You say, preacher, why, why bring that up? Because that's going to discourage people. Can I tell you, I'm just being honest with people. Not everybody's going to accept Christ. Not everybody's going to be excited about Christ. But the truth of the matter is it did have its rewards. 5,000 men got saved. 5,000 people got, got saved. Now listen, I think it's worth rejoicing over when the one lame man gets saved. I'm talking about we ought to shout it from the rooftops when people get saved. But my heart's still excited about Brother Richard getting saved. I'm telling you what, it's just an exciting time when people realize their need of Jesus Christ and they realize who they are and they're a sinner lost and without hope. Boy, I tell you what, I, I don't know how we could ever contain it. Five, ten, fifteen people get saved. Could you imagine that? That would, in today's society, that, that'd be a, uh, be a miracle. Can I tell you? One soul's in. Five thousand got in. We'd be building a new building next week or meeting out in the grass. But the fact of the matter is this. Peter and John were willing to pay the price that others could hear, Christ, hear about Christ. If we desire to church to be a success, if we want Wayside Baptist Church to be what God would have it to be, not in man's eyes, not that people would stand around and brag about 
the big facilities and the beauty of the facilities and all that kind of stuff. We have a, a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful building that God's uh, uh, blessed us with. But for God to look down and say, Wayside Baptist Church, I'm proud of you. In my eyes, you're a success. And there are parameters that got to be met. We need to be prepared. We need to follow the procedures. Stay close to the Word of God. Don't vary from the Word of God. Know that there's a purpose. And we will see progress. Our own efforts apart from these things are not going to be suffice. Let's stand to our feet with our heads bowed and eyes closed tonight. I just come back to the question. By the way, I'll just go ahead and tell you, if you say yes, you're in good company. But do you find yourself often at church, but not in church? I think every one of us could say that's been the case in our life. Maybe not every time, but sometimes. Can I tell you tonight, we ought to set our heart to be in. Investing in, prepared for, ready for what God has for us. Willing to step out of our comfort zones. Willing to stand in the gap where necessary. Willing to be different. Willing to pay a cost. If God should so ask. I don't want to be a has-been. I want God to look down and say, Wayside well, Baptist Church is what I want it to be. That preacher down there is what I want him to be. That church member is what I want them to be. They're involved. They're testifying. They're sharing the word of God with those that I give them opportunity to share with. We'll follow these things. God sends the increase. Our gracious God, Holy Father, I thank you for your precious word tonight. I thank you for the opportunity to gather in your name, to glorify you, to worship you, and also to learn of you. Lord, we, we know there are many people that are on our hearts tonight. We've mentioned many of our prayer requests already. Lord God, we have folks in our church that are not only dealing with physical needs in the way of health, Lord God, many are dealing with other financial struggles. Lord God, many are dealing with emotional struggles. Lord, many are dealing with very big spiritual struggles. And Lord God, you're the answer. You're the answer. You're the author and finisher of our faith and you're told us to look unto you. To cast our every care upon you. To trust you completely. To walk by faith and not by sight. Lord God, as we end this service tonight, Lord God, I want to say I'm thankful that we serve a risen Savior. And that truly you do talk with me and you walk with me and assure me that I'm your very own. Lord, I pray that tonight we'll leave this place with a greater zeal for the cause of Christ so that the gospel would be shared. A new desire, Lord God, to get in and not be just asked. Lord God, thank you for your precious word tonight. Thank you for the change that you brought in our lives. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. I do encourage you to continue to pray one for another. And I know that we've mentioned many of the prayer requests already. We have several that are that are really are going through some physical issues and things like that. Um, just uh, 
tonight, I, I know many people, if I have prayer requests, I need to continue to pray for Big D. He's been on my heart. And, uh, yeah, Brother Kyle. All right. Let's pray for Brother Rick, uh, former pastor here at the church. He needs his bone marrow, or getting a bone marrow transplant on Friday, you say? All right, let's pray about that tonight. And, um, Anybody else have anything that we need to share with the church? All right. Let's make these things a matter of prayer. Continue to lift up those that we, we've had on our prayer list and, and, and the ministries of the church. I, I'm just being honest with you, even with sickness, I hate to see us not having Warriors Church, I mean, uh, Master Club tonight. And so uh, even on the spur of the moment, if three-fourths of the people were sick or whatever, I still want to see it go forward. Uh, it just there's something about a pastor who doesn't want to see a ministry that is regularly scheduled have to be canceled unless there's snow on the ground or you know, something like that. Um, but just pray that uh, uh, God would help us in that direction. Now we continue to see the, the ministry itself grow, and, and it's hard to do that when we have to cancel things. And so uh, let's just make that a matter of prayer as well. All hearts clear tonight. All right, let's close in a word of prayer here. Lord, we love you. We come to you tonight. And Lord, it's a, it's a privilege, Lord God, to lift up Brother Rick tonight. And uh, Lord, many of these folks in here know him very well. And uh, Lord, he's got a serious health issue, been battling cancer. And Lord God, I pray that tonight, Lord, that this bone marrow transplant would be the things that he needs for his health. Uh, Lord, I pray, God, that you would uh, uh, give the doctors wisdom in the way they carry out the procedure. And Lord God, I pray that thy will be done. Lord, I do come before you tonight and ask you to be with the Brother Carr and his, uh, uh, his dear family and his girls, Lord God, and as they travel. And Lord, I pray that you would keep your hand upon them, allow them to continue to see souls saved and lives changed. Lord, I pray that you keep it fresh with them, Lord God. I pray that for every one of our missionaries and, and Lord, the evangelists and those that we support, Lord God, Lord, it, it could become so easy to go through the motions. So, Lord, I pray you just put your hand of protection upon them. Uh, build a hedge about them, Lord God. And uh, Lord, I pray that you give them victories in the areas they struggle in. Lord, every family, every person has struggles. Lord, we recognize that within our, in the confines of these walls, and we could expect nothing different from those that are outside these walls. So Lord, I pray, God, that you'd uh, give them the help that they need, Lord, the, uh, the, the right person to step in and encourage and strengthen and, and help, Lord God, where it's needed. And Lord God, tonight, Lord God, we'll just come before you and ask you to put your hand upon this place. And uh, be with the services to come. Lord God, if you tear your coming, I pray you'd bring us back again on Sunday morning. Lord God, uh, prepared and ready for what you have in store for us. Lord, help me as I prepare for Sunday. Lord God, I certainly need your hand upon me. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I thank you for being here tonight. Try to encourage somebody.